Good afternoon. Good morning. This is Lauren Wenzel at the National Marine Protected Area Center here with our monthly MPA webinar series. And um, we'd like to thank our partners, EBM Tools and Open Channels. We're really pleased today to have Fran Ulmer with us, who's the chair of the U.S. Arctic Research Commission, and she's going to be talking about a rapidly changing Arctic. And uh, I'm going to introduce Fran here in just a moment, but before I do that, I just wanted to mention that, uh, as many of you know who've participated in these before, we have uh, the, the webinar interface where you can ask your questions. So I encourage you, as the webinar goes along, to go ahead and ask your questions. And we will hold time at the end and make sure that we have plenty of time for discussion uh, so that Frank can address those questions. So uh, I will go ahead and introduce Fran. Uh, she is the ch chair of the U.S. Arctic Research Commission, where she has served since being appointed by President Obama in March 2011. Uh, and in June 2010, President Obama appointed her to the National Commission on the BP Deepwater Oil Spill and Offshore Drilling. Uh, before that, from 2007 to 2011, she was the chancellor of Alaska's largest public university, the University of Alaska Anchorage. Uh, she has also served as an elected official for 18 years as the mayor of Juneau, a state representative, and lieutenant governor of Alaska, and has worked as legal counsel to a variety of public bodies, um, including the Alaska legislature and the governor's office. Uh, so uh, I would like to welcome Fran, and thank you very much for being with us. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Lauren, and good morning and good afternoon to everyone. I wish we were all in the same room, but thank goodness for technology, this is possible. And what I'm going to do today is very briefly give you an overview of what is changing in the Arctic. And it's a lot. So I unfortunately will have to deal with a number of these topics pretty superficially. I'm going to assume that some of you know a lot about the Arctic already but some of you may not, so this uh, presentation will be understandably quite broad. Let me say at the outset that for those of us who live in the Arctic, in the Arctic region, it's been quite amazing to see the amount of coverage that this region has received in recent years. For a long time we felt uh, <laughs> pretty much ignored, but recently there's been a lot of press coverage. And some of it's been pretty good, and some of it's been uh, actually slightly weird. Some of it goes into a fair amount of detail about what's happening, and some of it is pretty much about uh, charismatic megafauna like polar bears, which of course are important, but also attract a lot of attention. Some of it is um, hard for people who don't know very much about the Arctic to really be able to calibrate discussions of permafrost, for example. Um, if you know very much about it, it's really interesting for a lot of people. It's, what's that all about? So I like to start with uh, a pretty basic slide, and that is the difference between the Arctic and the Antarctic. I know that seems strange, but, you know, yes, they're both cold and they have a lot of ice, but after that, they're pretty dissimilar, actually. Uh, the Arctic with eight countries that border it and have national jurisdictions with, with significant national interests, not to mention four million people, and with a, a fair amount of um, both internal and external politics. The Antarctic, obviously, um, very, very different, covered by a treaty which has as its main focus science and peace. Logistics are an issue, there's a lot of cooperation among the countries, but a very different place. Uh, land surrounded by an ocean versus an ocean surrounded by land. In the Arctic, think polar bears and people. In the Antarctic, think penguins. Um, so from the standpoint of the United States, we actually have a law, the Arctic Research Policy Act of 1984, that defines the Arctic region for purposes of not only science and research, but for focus areas for federal agencies. And what's unusual about it is that it's not just the Arctic Circle, it is also it includes the Bering Sea because of the significant environmental and ecological connection between the Bering Sea and the Chukchi, um, which we could talk about later, but it's, it's unusual, but it is significant. This region is changing perhaps more quickly than any other region on the face of our planet. And some of that is temperature, for example, uh, twice the global rate, but in Alaska, four degrees warmer than ever before. A declining sea ice, lots of coverage about that, 
but also rapidly changing ecosystems. The thawing permafrost is having a huge impact on coastal erosion and communities literally in a position of having to move. And a lot of increased human activity, interest, and international interest in this region. The record low Arctic sea ice comparisons, I'm sure you have seen these photos before of really a rather stunning change between the 30-year average and the record low in 2012. And yes, every year it fluctuates a little more, a little less, a little more, a little less, but the trend is quite clear in terms of losing Arctic summer sea ice. It's not just an area. 50% reduction in sea ice extent in the summertime low. But what's really remarkable is a 75% loss in volume. In other words, it's getting thinner. That means we are losing multi-year ice, which has significant implications for ice-dependent species, as well as for human utilization of this region. It's impacting productivity in ways that we don't fully understand what it means for ice-dependent species to have so much less summer sea ice in terms of the changes that are happening, the phenology, the extent to which species have relied on a system that was quite stable for a long time that is now changing quite rapidly. Uh, there are many questions. All we can say right now is that the present doesn't look like the past and the future is not going to look like the present. It's having many implications in systems that we cannot see and find very difficult to really be able to calibrate. And one example of that is the level of ocean acidification, which is more pronounced in the Arctic Ocean than it is in many other areas in the ocean. That is for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is colder water holds CO2 more consistently. And that is having a big impact also on species because the food webs are relatively simple and so minor changes can really have significant implications. So let's change gears just a little bit from the environment and ecological in interests but also now to the human and the sort of global economic interests. We see a lot of not only interest in, press coverage in, but also research in these various areas of potential expanded human use of the Arctic region. Shipping, fishing, tourism, mining, oil and gas, some of this driven by easier access, some of it driven simply by global economics and the desire to find those new frontiers. That puts in play a variety of really interesting conflicts between global interests and local interests. Global interests for resources, local interests in not only maintaining stability, but being assured of food security in a region that for many people for thousands of years has have lived off the land and the waters of the region. How all of this is changing is still quite in not really well understood. And particularly when you see things like the Crystal Serenity, the huge cruise ship that plans to go from Alaska through the Northwest Passage across Canada and down to the East Coast next summer, you think about also the implications of safety and concern for the passengers and the crew if something goes wrong, given that this region has very limited infrastructure and very limited response capacity. So many, many questions about what it means for both the environment and the people. The changing access is really what is quite notable. And it is of interest not only to the global economic interests and local people, but also to the national defense of all of the Arctic nations, concern about whether we are prepared, whether or not we are ready for literally the opening of a new ocean. The new ocean routes that are being discussed generally are two. The Northern Sea Route, which goes over Russia, the Northwest Passage, which goes over Canada. 
generally speaking, there is more interest in, more discussion about the northern sea route for a variety of reasons. Uh, the area above Russia is losing ice more rapidly than Canada. Matter of fact, the northern region above Canada is likely to be one of the ice refugias for ice-dependent species. That's a combination of factors including currents and, and topography. But it's also because the Russians are promoting the northern sea route as a new shipping option. And they are doing their best in a variety of uh, ways to build out the infrastructure, adding more icebreakers, adding more ports, and promoting this as an alternative to southern sea routes. But regardless of which of those may actually develop in the future, they all go through some significant choke points, including the Bering Strait off the coast of Alaska. A tremendous concern, not only because it is a very narrow area and a relatively shallow area, but because it is also a significant area for marine uh, mammal migration. So will the Arctic become a major shipping route? Um, maybe, maybe not. Uh, it, it is unquestionably plagued with many limitations, uh, poor hydrography, very limited charting, very limited infrastructure. Uh, but the International Maritime Organization, the IMO, has been studying, working on, and finally adopted a mandatory polar code, which is really a, an attempt to reduce the, some of the risks associated with shipping in the Arctic, and that becomes effective in January of 2017. But exactly how it will do, deal with things like the conflicts with marine mammal migration, with the local subsistence harvesting of whales and other marine mammals in this area, um, all of that remains to be seen. Uh, fishing is also sometimes talked about as an opportunity for the Arctic region as it changes, as access becomes more readily available. But as you may know, a number of years ago, the United States declared a moratorium on fishing, commercial fishing. And the United States has worked with the other Arctic nations, who all of which recognize that a moratorium in the Central Arctic Ocean is appropriate given how little we know about the fish and how unable we would be to responsibly manage a fishery for sustainable use. So uh, the good news is the five coastal Arctic nations have agreed that they should move forward with a moratorium and encourage the other nations of the world to do the same thing so that there isn't a race for resources in a region that we know so little of, and a region that is being significantly impacted by things like acidification. This was an interesting study that was done at the University of Alaska Fairbanks that basically looked at how is acidification already impacting existing fisheries off the coast of Alaska. So uh, all of this just speaks to how wise it is that a moratorium for the Central Arctic Ocean be adopted. Oil and gas attracts a lot of attention in the media. And, and this is for a variety of reasons. The USGS did a report in 2009 that estimated that a significant portion of the remaining oil, natural gas, and natural gas liquids in the world will be found in the Arctic and have estimated, based on the darker it is, the more likely there would actually be uh, resources found. This has stimulated a lot of interest. And there's a lot of speculation about where it is and whether or not the economics are right to develop it. As you may know, Shell has decided not to go forward with the development in the Chukchi uh, after uh, several years of exploratory work and basically a dry hole or an insignificant amount of oil. Uh, in their August drilling this year, they decided not to go forward. But there are still other leases in the Beaufort and the Chukchi. At this point in time, probably not going to be developed, but economics can change that. Economics are a pretty important part of whether or not the resources in the Arctic will be developed because of a number of limiting factors, higher costs driven by not only the extreme cold and the hazardous conditions, 
the need for specialized equipment and specialized vessels, but the lack of infrastructure and response capacity. Some of those things are challenges for any kind of development in the Arctic. And it's important to say that the Arctic in, is not just one place. In other words, the Norwegian Arctic is quite a bit different than the Alaska Arctic. It has a lot less ice and has much more infrastructure. So these are broad characterizations, but they do apply. They certainly apply to much of the US and Canadian Arctic and in general are true throughout the region. Costs and barriers that really make it much more difficult to work in this area. That also means that working in this area from the standpoint of large industrial operations poses some significant threats to fish and wildlife and to the way of life of the residents of the Arctic. Many of the indigenous people who live in the Arctic have a significant reliance on marine mammals, fish, birds, etc. And so particularly from the standpoint of food security, but also from the standpoint of access, they have been using ice roads, for example, for thousands of years. All of that is changing. For the Arctic residents, and I will speak quite directly, more directly to the Alaska indigenous, the Inupiat and Yupik Eskimo particularly, the impacts to subsistence foods and cultural practices, the impacts to their villages and coastal uh, erosion that is happening and the infrastructure challenges, but also from their perspective, the opportunities that some of those additional economic activities could present to them, to their native villages, to their corporations, to their people. So there is definitely um, pluses and minuses, and exactly how that unfolds remains to be seen. Critical to most is this notion of food security because subsistence, or in other words, using the resources of the lands and waters of Alaska, are extremely important to Alaska native people. And the extent to which communities like Shishmaref and Kivalina and Nutak have already decided that they cannot sustain life where they are. There have been votes to move. There have been planning exercises to move to areas where coastal erosion and thawing permafrost do not threaten their, their buildings, their highways, or their airports, their, their schools. So these changes are up close and personal for many of the people who live in the Arctic. But what does it mean to people who live in the rest of the world? Are they really paying attention to what's changing in the Arctic and how it might affect them? How much are they paying attention to all of the climate change implications and the adaptations that may be required? There's a lot of interesting social science research about, about this, about whether or not people who live in mid-latitudes are really paying attention until it affects them, whether that storms and changes in weather patterns or the threat of sea level rise or the current existing sea level rises that are happening in some places. Uh, storms and the news coverage of change uh, may promote action. You know, there, there, is, uh, there are a number of folks like uh, Jennifer Francis, for example, who have done recent research in this area of how the jet stream is changing as a result of a warmer Arctic. It, the, the oscillation of the jet stream bringing colder areas, the colder air to areas that are less anticipating that and longer periods of drought and rain and cold and heat. Uh, there's still a lot of questions associated with the, the assumption that the warmer Arctic is having significant impact on mid-latitude weather. But nonetheless, this uh, science is attracting more attention and giving people more of an awareness that what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. Let's change gears now and talk a bit about international interests and international organizations. The longest standing entity that has really been a focus point for the Arctic nations is the Arctic Council. It was created almost 20 years ago as an intergovernmental forum. 
it is really an effort for of the eight Arctic nations to promote cooperation and coordination. They have had from day one two principal focus areas, sustainable development and environmental protection. And those remain the fundamental building blocks of all of the work that is done by the Arctic Council. The eight member states, Canada, Denmark, slash Greenland, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Russia, Sweden, and the United States work very successfully on science projects, on best practices, on monitoring in a way that is really continuing a level of not only agreement, understanding, um, peacefulness, but in spite of some of the media coverage that really tries to promote this notion that there's increased tension in the Arctic, uh, as a general rule, that is not true. Another very unusual aspect of the Arctic Council is the presence of what are termed permanent participants. In other words, representatives from the indigenous people of the North. These six groups sit at the table. They are treated somewhat differently than the eight Arctic nations that have, of course, national responsibilities, but they, their involvement and full participation gives to the Arctic Council work the kind of gravitas and local place-based understanding of local knowledge, traditional knowledge, and indigenous values that really strengthens the Arctic Council work. The Arctic Council also has observer nations and observer organizations. Here are some of the, the observers listed here. I know you may be surprised to see countries like India and Singapore and China, but this represents what I would describe as the growing awareness by the nations of the world that this region has significant importance, that it's an area that is valuable as well as very vulnerable, and that they can contribute not only through science, but also through response and potentially economic development. The Arctic Council structure, the ministers at the very top are at the level of Secretary John Kerry from the State Department for the United States. He is our minister and at that level in the other countries as well. But on an ongoing basis, it's the senior Arctic officials, that is the person designated by each of the ministers, that pretty much runs the operation. Our senior Arctic official is Julie Gorley, and she has done that work for the United States for, oh, at least a decade, maybe longer. Um, there are working groups, six standing working groups, and from time to time task forces. Those working groups really engage many of the people, not only in federal agencies and NGOs, in universities, but others who can contribute to the work that is done at that level. The working groups have not only produced amazing reports, but they are a continuing presence on issues that are of importance to the Arctic Council. The wide range of reports that have been produced by the working groups are particularly notable. Everything from the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment to the Arctic Ocean Review, which was completed a year or two ago. The Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment that was done in 2009, I would say, remains sort of the Bible. If you are interested in one document that looks at how have things changed in the Arctic with regard to shipping and what needs to be done to make shipping safer, uh, you want to go to the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment. At any rate, there are a number of these reports that would be useful uh, to you in a variety of ways, and I urge you to go to the Arctic Council website and use it as a resource. What has changed in recent years at the Arctic Council table is the effort to reach agreements that can be tabled in other words, agreed to by the eight Arctic nations at the Arctic Council table, but then actually authorized by the eight Arctic states. Because the Arctic Council was never created by a treaty, it doesn't have the authority to adopt agreements itself. It can recommend and has recommended 
two and is about to recommend a third agreement. So the one that uh, was done on search and rescue a couple of years ago and on responding to oil spills in the Arctic, both of those were quite different from previous work done by the Arctic Council. Those have both been adopted by all of the Arctic Eight and work under those have been moving forward so that the countries can help each other in case of disaster. The International Cooperation on Scientific Research is um, under discussion. It is likely to be adopted uh, in the next year or two. Uh, Kelly Faulkner from NSF has been leading that effort on, the ha on behalf of the United States. So every two years, the chairmanship of the Arctic Council changes. The US became the chair again uh, last spring. And when a country becomes chair for that two-year period of time, it suggests an agenda. The agenda actually has to be adopted by the full Arctic Council because it's a consensus-based organization. But the three themes that the US tabled, Arctic Ocean safety and security, whoops, what happened here? Are you still looking at the PowerPoint? It went um, back to your original slide. Now we're back to U U.S. Chairmanship oh, Program. Great. I'm not sure exactly why, but at any rate. Um, so here are the three themes. Arctic Ocean Safety, Improving Economic Living Conditions of the People of the Arctic, Addressing the Impacts of Climate Change, and two overarching goals of strengthening the Arctic Council process and public diplomacy, which means an outreach effort to help educate the world about what's happening in the Arctic. Under all three of those, there are specific projects, and I'm not going to take the time to go through it. And you may not even be able to read those. Maybe you can. But it's a wide range from water and sanitation to uh, improving climate resilience in communities to uh, Arctic Ocean acidification uh, and looking at black carbon. So there's a wide variety of things under those three and the working groups are working on them. I just wanted to call out one, the marine protected area uh, goal being worked on, again, under, under the working group pain. The idea here is to take to another level the understanding of what marine protected areas can do and to understand what is happening right now and to identify best practices for how not only those marine protected areas can be effective, but also how to engage people in the region to use those in productive ways. So I just close by saying that John Kerry is the second Secretary of State for the United States that has taken a significant interest in the Arctic. Um, before him, Hillary Clinton was the first Secretary of State to ever personally attend an Arctic Council meeting. So I would just note that in recent years, there has been a huge step up in interest and participation, not only by the State Department, but by the entire federal government in Arctic issues. Which brings me to the section that I want to speak on today in terms of what our national agenda is in the Arctic. The U.S. has many interests in this region, from national defense to maritime safety, from scientific research to the indigenous people of the region. There are many interests in the Arctic. And that has been recognized perhaps more profoundly in the last 20 or 30 years with the adoption of several of the things that I mentioned on this slide. The Arctic Research Policy Act of 1984 the act that drew those lines that included the Bering Sea in the U.S. definition of the Arctic is what created the Arctic Research Commission that I chair and IARPIC, which I'll talk about in a little while, and sort of declared the broad goals. Those goals became much more defined when the State Department adopted the Arctic Region Policy back in 2009. Since then, there has been a steady march of federal agency engagement and focus on the Arctic. Most significantly with the adoption of the National Arctic Strategy in May of 2013 by President Obama and then the adoption of the Implementation Plan in 2014 and an executive order that was adopted in 2015 creating an entity that is really charged with assuring that the 
plan and the not only the national strategy but the implementation plan would actually move forward. The Arctic Executive Steering Committee, AESC, which was created by that executive order, is to implement the National Arctic Strategy. And the National Arctic Strategy, which you can look at online, really focuses on three things. Our national security interests, stewardship of the region, and international cooperation. Interestingly enough, if you looked at the national strategy of all of the Arctic eight nations, they pretty much all have these same three key areas, sometimes a few more, but whether you're looking at the Russian, the Norwegian, the Finnish, the Canadian, or the US strategy, they all look very similar. It's about stewardship, it's about security, it's about international cooperation. And usually it's also about a national agenda, sometimes couched in terms of the importance of indigenous people, sometimes couched in terms of economic development, but they're all pretty similar. The executive order, which I mentioned, which created this effort to really focus on our national strategy, is something of a first. And I would say that it is being taken very seriously by John Holdren, the head of the Office of Science and Technology Policy, who is the chair of AESC. He, of course, is a very busy man, so he has appointed an executive director, Mark Brzezinski, who on an ongoing basis, day in and day out, is really focused on doing this work. Mark Brzezinski, some of you may recognize the name, he was the US ambassador to Sweden until uh, a few months ago. He's very knowledgeable about the Arctic Council, about the Arctic region, and very committed to making the AESC effective in achieving the goals of not only the National Arctic Strategy, but also supporting the US chairmanship of the Arctic Council. They're also focused on making good on some of the promises that were made during the conference that was held in Anchorage in August of 2015, at which President Obama, Secretary Kerry, Secretary, uh, actually a number of a agency people were there, Sally Jewell from the Department of Interior and others, came to talk about the importance of the Arctic region, the importance of climate change and how it is affecting the Arctic, and the need for additional scientific research, monitoring and observing, and understanding what it is that is needed to make communities more resilient, given how much change is happening. All of these things, at the international level, at the national level, or even at the state level, and, and this is just uh, one of the recent things done at the state of Alaska level, the Alaska Arctic Policy Commission, which produced a report in January of 2015, sort of looking at these issues from a state perspective, they all share a few common interests. And I'm going to talk briefly about those before I talk about research and then call uh, and then finish. There's a shared interest in understanding climate change and understanding the impacts of climate change as it affects humans, as it affects the environment and our ecosystem and biodiversity. So understanding what increased storms and, in, and unpredictable weather events are doing to our communities. Understanding how sea ice and glacial retreat are affecting the very delicate and finely tuned ecosystems of the Arctic. Understanding how ocean acidification may impact ocean productivity and, and fisheries. So there's a shared interest at all levels in these things. There's a shared interest in community resilience in making certain that for the four million people who call the Arctic home, there is an awareness and an understanding and an enabling of people to make the changes necessary particularly in, in infrastructure and in energy resources, but also how the resilience of language and culture and subsistence and dependence on the land can actually support the continuing health of the people. And there's a shared interest in safety. This goes speaks to our stewardship responsibility. And that's everything from safety at the national level to safety in marine uh, shipping, etc., 
and being able to respond to disasters, whether or not those are tourism or oil and gas or, or even scientific research disasters. And there's a shared interest in research, in being able to obtain the additional information, but also understanding of a region that is experiencing such dramatic change and that is having dramatic impact on the entire world. Interest in better understanding so that we can make better choices in reducing costs, in reducing risks, and in assuring that for the stakeholders of the region, there is enough understanding to be able to use that information that is gained through scientific research, through observing, through monitoring, and through building up a more comprehensive view of an understanding of this region to really support decision making. Decisions that are based on better understanding and better knowledge are going to have longer term stability, longer term ability to protect this region and to assure the resilience of the communities. So what is needed to support research in the Arctic? A wide variety of things, not the least of which is multi-year funding, but also the technology that allows for the ability to collect information without necessarily putting human lives at risk, because research in the Arctic is not only expensive, it's also dangerous. So AUVs and drones and gliders and additional infrastructure like ice-capable vessels and the ability to observe and monitor sometimes in the water, on the ground, but sometimes also via satellites. There are many things that need, are needed to support Arctic research. Thank goodness uh, during the stimulus, some funding was found to support a new ice-strengthened research vessel, the Kuliak, which is Alaska-based but is being used in many places. Um, it, it is one of many that are needed, but uh, the good news is it, ha it came online and it is now in the water. So let me finish with a brief description of the Arctic Research Commission before we open this up to questions. What is it? It is an independent entity that it gives advice. That's what we were created to do by Congress back in 1984. So we provide advice to Congress, to federal agencies, to the Office of the President. We are appointed by the President. There are seven members of the Commission that are directly appointed by the President and a standing ex officio member, the Director of the National Science Foundation. And as you can see from this slide, it's a mix of Alaskans and non-Alaskans with expertise in the Arctic. We produce a variety of reports. We hold workshops. Here's an example of one of the reports we did a few years ago, which basically asked the question, what do we know about the research that has been done and how you would respond to an oil spill in Arctic waters? What do we know and what don't we know? And so it kind of catalogs all the research that has been done, the research that's underway, and it poses questions. If you want to really know more about how to handle oil spills in the Arctic, what are the research questions that are most important? You can find that at our webpage. You can also find at our webpage our most recent goals report. This goals report is an example of one that has produced, been produced either annually or biannually ever since the Arctic Research Commission was created. It's a broad picture view of what the most important areas of research in the Arctic are. And under these six general categories, there are many specific examples given in the goals report of why these things matter and why they are relevant not only to the people of the Arctic, but also to the people of the world. So how does that fit together? How does the goals report and how does the work that the Arctic Research Commission do fit together with things like IARPIC and ultimately the budget? The way the law in 1984 set it up was that we're very interconnected. So the Arctic Research Commission sets these broad policy goals, which helps inform the IARPIC, which stands for the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee, the group of federal agencies that have an interest in and do research in the Arctic. They adopt a five-year research plan. 
and they're about to re-up that research plan, which is which was adopted back in 2013. It identifies key areas in which the federal agencies can work together to meet not only their goals in terms of their federal agency responsibilities in the Arctic, but also to make sure that what money they are spending on Arctic research is complementary. And that informs the Office of Management and Budget and the Office of Science and Technology Policy in terms of priorities. It is unquestionably a system that is not perfect, but that's the system. I mentioned the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee. And I suspect some of you are already involved in some of these working groups. The 12 research themes really represent areas of interest to multiple agencies. In other words, not just one of our federal agencies cares about glaciers and fjords. Multiples do. And how can Navy and NOAA and others work together to effectively utilize whatever research dollars are available? Um, and non-federal partners can also engage. And if you aren't already interest, involved, you might go to iarcticcollaborations.org to check it out. So in conclusion, I would just say that a rapidly changing Arctic presents both opportunities and many challenges. For many of us who live in the Arctic, balancing the development and those opportunities with the importance of stewardship and protecting the region is easier said than done. But a common denominator is reducing risk and trying to make sure that the decisions that are made by federal agencies, by local governments, by private entrepreneurs, by others, is informed by the best available information based on the scientific research and the synthesis of that research and the communication of those results to the general public. This is my last slide. If you want to know more about either the Arctic Research Commission or if on a daily basis you would like to subscribe to the daily update, which we do, which gives you an overview of what's going on in the Arctic. Everything from recent pronouncements by elected officials and policymakers, laws that have been passed that impact the Arctic, meetings that are being held, interesting scientific research results that have recently been published, go to arctic.gov. You can subscribe to the newsletter. You can look at the goals report that I mentioned or any of the other reports that we have produced over the years. And you can also find a link to a website which is sort of a portal to portals. In other words, if you're interested in a general topic area, that portal will show you other portals at which you might be able to obtain the information that you're looking for. So finally, before we open it up to question, I just want to mention that in the news section, you will find a reference to the January 14th meeting, which is being held by the National Science Academy of Sciences and the Polar Board and the US Arctic Research Commission in Washington, DC. The title of that conference is Why the Arctic Matters. And particularly for those of you who are in DC, and are interested in this topic, you might want to join us January 14th in Washington, D.C. at that meeting, uh, Why the Arctic Matters, an all-day seminar basically on why not only the Arctic change is interesting and relevant to the rest of the world, but how it might connect with the work that you do as well. So on that note, uh, let me close out and open it up to questions. Okay, Fran, thanks for that wonderful overview. I know people really appreciated that. And we do have some big picture questions, but before I get into that, could you just uh, say again who's sponsoring the Why the Arctic Matters and where people can go for more information? The National Academy of Sciences, the Polar Board, and the U.S. Arctic Research Commission. And if you go to arctic.gov, you will find information about it. Great, thank you. Okay, so there's a, some big picture questions here I wanted to start with. Uh, one from Margot Bohan who asks, can you elaborate on the benefits of international collaboration in the Arctic and the most effective ways to engage in this from your perspective? Well, the benefits range from uh, sort of confidence building exercise with countries that we 
may have sometimes some difficulties with, and I'll just give you a current example. I mean, the ability for the United States and Canada to sit down with Russian colleagues in Washington, D.C. 10 days ago and talk about the importance of doing collaborative research in uh, the ecosystem of the Central Arctic Ocean so that we better understand uh, the potential for fisheries and why we need a fisheries moratorium is a great example. So there, here's cooperation among fisheries scientists, ecologists, oceanographers with a country that both the United States, Canada, and the rest of the world may be having some very significant stresses over in terms of our differences of opinion in different regions of the world. So maintaining partnerships with other countries that we may have stressed relationships with in other places in the world, like Russia, um, science is an important uh, way of maintaining connections. So at that very high level, it's great. I think international scientific collaborations also means that we have a more comprehensive understanding of the region because there isn't an Alaska Arctic, a Canada Arctic, a Russia Arctic that doesn't in some way get all connected. In other words, our, that region is a shared region. So by doing cooperative science, we all gain a better understanding of a region that we share. Um, I would say that it also include, encourages stewardship. I think to the extent that not only various countries research organizations, universities, federal agencies, etc., understand how this region and how the science that is done in this region can support better decision making that supports stewardship of a region that is very vulnerable. All of those things are good. I could go on and on. In terms of how to best do it uh, or how to engage, I would say that the Arctic Council Working Groups is an easy open door well, maybe it's not a completely open door because it, you, you do have to have some expertise in the area and you, you do have to kind of be willing to commit some time. But that is one way. And there are actually a number of other organizations that really can be used, including NGOs like World Wildlife Fund, WWF, and others that really uh, encourage broad participation in these efforts. Um, I'll stop there. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the, the moratorium on fishing in the Central Arctic Ocean and the work on that. There are a couple of questions uh, about that subject, wanting to know about um, what countries are participating in that and um, what is the, are, there, are there considerations on other extractive activities in the Central Arctic? This is just focused on fisheries, and it is based on the recognition that we know so little about what is actually under the ice, what, we, what, is, so, what, what is being changed by the rapid disappearance of ice, that the five Arctic countries that actually border the Arctic Ocean, that's Norway, Russia, Canada, Greenland, and the United States, those are the five countries that border the Arctic Ocean, they have agreed and they have been meeting for at least three years on and off to evolve this shared understanding of what a moratorium might look like and, that, and more recently uh, a, a description of what kind of science could and should be done collaboratively to build up a better understanding of the fish uh, and the ecology. Yes, there is an effort to reach out to all other fishing nations to come on board. And exactly how that will progress over time, uh, who's to say? But uh, the fact that those five have been meeting and have reached a consensus on this point, I think, is very meaningful. Whether or not uh, it might expand to other kinds of activities, at this point in time, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Um, all right. Then getting back to um, another big picture question, could you talk about what you think are the most significant gaps that we need to address when it comes to Arctic marine resource management? Well, given that we don't have a whole lot of time, what I'm going to do is refer you to a document. Um, 
the AESC, um, the Arctic Executive Steering Committee, did a gaps and overlaps report uh, last spring. And that gaps report is a very useful document in looking at kind of what are the gaps and what might be done to fill those gaps by federal agencies. So I'll, I'll just refer you to the AESC website, to the implementation plan for the national strategy. Uh, but, you know, on, I, I want to be completely honest here. Funding is a huge problem. So filling in the gaps, whether they be communication system and communication infrastructure gaps, whether they be gaps like the need for more icebreakers in a region that is becoming more accessible and hence will actually have more shipping traffic. I mean, there's a whole lot of gaps identified in that report, and I would suggest that you take a look at it. Okay. Um, we have a question from Jorge de Vincente asking, can you talk about the current scramble to stake out continental shelf claims by Arctic nations? Yes, and, and I apologize for not including um, the Law of the Sea Treaty as, as a topic, but there were a number of things that are very important that I couldn't cover this morning. So the Law of the Sea Treaty, which deals with uh, how countries will be able to prove up and establish their extended continental shelf claims, that treaty has been adopted by over 145 countries. All of the other Arctic nations have adopted it and ratified it, but the United States has not. The United States has been discussing the adoption of the Law of the Sea Treaty for a long time. As a matter of fact, our, our nation um, proceeds as though it were adopted, and we were very instrumental in proposing it in the first place. But as you may have noticed, our current United States Senate is very reluctant to approve any treaties, and it has been blocked by um, what I would describe as a very misunderstood uh, interpretation of what the Law of the Sea is all about. The treaty has a very clear mechanism for countries to do the science that is required to prove up their extended continental shelf claims. And several of the countries in the Arctic either have already or are about to deliver to the International Commission that actually reviews these claims. So Russia has already submitted its claims, and a number of the other countries are ready. <coughs> I would not describe it as a scramble. I would describe it as a very orderly process, which is clearly described by law, not just for Arctic nations, but for all the nations of the world. So you go through a rather significant effort of proving up those claims by doing the hydrology, excuse me, I'm losing my voice here, <coughs> the hydrographic work. I might just note the U.S. has been doing that work uh, in partnership in some cases with Canada. Our, our icebreaker, the Healy, has been doing it with the Louis Saint-Laurent of Canada. So we are doing the science that is required if and when the United States Senate approves the treaty and ratifies the treaty in a way that will allow the United States to also make its claims. Until we ratify the treaty, we do not have standing to submit a claim. The process requires you to have signed up on the treaty uh, to be able to actually extend your continental shelf. So the United States is really shooting itself in the foot by not being able to move forward in the way in which the other Arctic nations are moving forward. And that's no one's fault but uh, our own in our inability to, I guess, clearly articulate all of the advantages associated with ratifying the treaty. Okay, a uh, couple of uh, logistical things. One is that yes, we will be publishing a uh, recording of this website on the Open Channels website. So if you have to go or didn't hear all of it, it will be posted there. And another comment that the arctic.gov website doesn't seem to be working right now. 
So I encourage people just to check back if they're having problems with that website. Um, there's a question about Russia. You talked a little bit earlier, Fran, about working with Russia. And the question is, um, how, how is that relationship faring in the Arctic? And is it productive cooperation, or uh, has it been hampered by conflicting interests, particularly on environmental protection matters? Well, it, it's, um, it is better than you might expect, given the conflicts in other areas of the world and given the heated political rhetoric associated with uh, the positioning of our countries and actually all the countries in the world surrounding um, mid-latitude conflicts. So generally speaking, it is as good in the Arctic, a relationship with Russia is as good in the Arctic as I think it is any place because of a shared commitment, not only to the Arctic Council process, but to the recognition that there's more to be gained by working together than there is to be gained by uh, having significant differences of opinion in this region where we share so many similar interests, objectives, and concerns. So, for example, the U.S. Coast Guard has met with the Russian equivalent and worked out protocols associated with if there is a shipping disaster in the Bering Strait or an oil spill disaster, the equivalent of the Coast Guards of all Arctic nations have, have a working group. And that is not in any way being upset by the difficulty in our relationship in other places. So I, I don't want to uh, put too much frosting on the cake. Uh, unquestionably, there are some areas in which there are emerging difficulties. For example, sometimes scientists are finding it more difficult to get visas approved for the research that they want to do. Or sometimes they show up with all their gear and they can't get their gear to do the research they want to do. It, it is not a perfect relationship. But generally speaking, when you go to Arctic conferences, you will find that the Russians who are attending are speaking the same general language of cooperation that the U.S. and all of the other Arctic nations are. So we hope that that continues. It is certainly in the best interests of the Arctic for that to continue. Okay, and here's an, a question having to do with the fishing moratorium uh, from Jerry Rising who asks, um, any fishing moratorium and other changes may affect indigenous people. Are they being subsidized or redirected when these actions are taken? Well, the indigenous people uh, aren't fishing in the Central Arctic Ocean now. Um, so it, it's not one of those things where there has to be a compensation for something that already exists because it doesn't already exist. And, and we're not talking about nearshore coastal fishing at all. Um, the subsistence harvest that is happening and even to a certain extent, uh, what you might think of as commercial fishing in the Arctic in nearshore areas, whether it's off the coast of Norway or Iceland or Greenland or anyplace else, that's not affected by this moratorium. This so one, is basically dealing with an area that is not being fished now. And it can't be because it is only recently being exposed. And as I said before, it is an area that we don't understand, so couldn't possibly manage it sustainably. And by the way, I just went on the Arctic.gov website, so it, it's working. So it may be a federal agency problem. I don't know. I just went on it with my personal computer. Okay, thanks. And I'm going to throw in one last question, um, which has to do with the indigenous question. Fran, you mentioned the permanent participants and their role in the Arctic Council. How would you characterize the effectiveness or the steps that are being taken to um, consult and involve uh, indigenous people in the U.S. in uh, decisions that are being made in the Arctic? Well, there are many answers to that, but in the very limited time we have left, in terms of the Arctic Council process, uh, four of the six permanent participant groups are Alaska. So uh, they have a pretty large voice at the table, and I would say have pretty actively participated for as long as I've been engaged with Arctic Council things, and that's 20 years. Uh, in terms of domestic policy and nas the national Arctic strategy, 
Uh, there are many ways in which the federal government, both federal agencies, specifically at the agency level as well as the White House, are making an effort to effectively engage decision making. That changes with every administration and it differs, I suspect, from uh, year to year based on individual engagement. But there has certainly been much more awareness of the importance of doing so and creating doors and windows uh, to open to that process so that not only traditional knowledge but also local knowledge can be incorporated in not only the scientific research piece of this but in the national strategy implementation. All right. Well, it's now 2 o'clock here in Washington, D.C., so I just want to thank Fran, and I know several of you wrote in to thank her for her excellent presentation. And thank you all for your uh, participation and your great questions. And we will be posting this online at Open Channels. And again, thank you very much.